well be aware that point and click adventure games are my all time favourite genre of game. Throughout my time making videos on this channel, I've become the point and click adventure game guy. I've got a whole playlist dedicated to the genre that encapsulates roughly half of my uploads. My first major call out video is about a point and click, and I even stream them every Thursday on my Twitch. It's fair to say that my reputation as the adventure game guy has not been unearned. I'm a big fan. But you have to remember that when I started this channel, I'd only been playing adventure games for maybe two or three years. I started off in 2010 after all with a free Sam and Max episode. That spiralled into me playing all the Sam and Max games and soon after that, Monkey Island. It just so happens that my discovery of the genre coincided roughly with the release of the special editions of both Monkey Islands 1 and 2, as well as the release of Telltale's own Monkey Island series. All in all, it was a good time to become a fan. But to actually talk about these games on YouTube always seemed like a daunting task. People asked me for years and I'd always said it would happen, but I was a bit afraid to go there. You see, The Secret of Monkey Island is probably one of the most formative games of the early 90s. Not many games from 1990 have aged quite as well, and it may well be responsible for driving the entire genre down a new path. For that reason, it was daunting to tackle the games to say the least. I was tempted to delve into Escape from Monkey Island at one point because that game upsets me. But I never felt like the time was right to talk about Monkey Island in general. For a while now, I floated the idea of a Monkey Island retrospective, where we review every single Monkey Island game in a row, in depth, talking about everything. And looking at the length of this video, yeah, this may have been a bigger undertaking than I ever anticipated. But here we are, and I'm finally ready to talk about Monkey Island. Starting with the first game for its 30th anniversary, The Secret of Monkey Island, made in 1990 by Lucasfilm Games. One important matter to get out the way before we start is the version of the game that I'll be playing. There's the original 16 colour EGA version which came on floppy disks, the CD version with updated pixel art, and the 2009 Special Edition. Now, I have my own hang-ups about the Special Edition. I think the graphics leave quite a bit to be desired, with some awkward, janky animations that look immeasurably worse when you just translate the sprites directly into new art. Plus, I'm not a big fan of the art style in general that it goes for. There are some nice bits, of course, like the water looks great, but some of the background are so obviously unfinished. And oh god, what did they do with Guybrush's hair? Believe it or not, there are actually mods that fix Guybrush's hair for this version. We Monkey Island fans are very passionate about Guybrush's hair. Speaking of mods, my preferred version of the game is called the Ultimate Talkie Edition, which is what I'll be using for this video. I'll provide a link for it in the description. Running from the CD version of Scum VM, this version injects the new voiceover from the Special Edition into the game. Because honestly, the new voiceover is great. And it stays faithful with later games in the series, with Dominic Armato, Earl Bone, and Alexandra Boyd, among others, reprising their roles and still sounding great. Tragically, you can only combine the old CD graphics with Special Edition voices through modding. Hence, Ultimate Talkie. I personally think it's the definitive way of playing the game. You might disagree, but I think it's good to have options. You may be a purist for the original 16 colour look, or you might be a fan of how the Special Edition brings it closer in line with the style used in Curse. Or, alternatively, you might even be a fan of the CGA version, if you really want to be. All in all, it's up to you. Those options are there for you. There are so many ways to enjoy this game, but first, let's find out where it came from. The brain behind Monkey Island was Ron Gilbert, who you might have heard of, but if you haven't, he was responsible for a lot of the early point-and-click adventure game hits for LucasArts, until he left in 1992 to start a little point-and-click company called Humongous Entertainment. You might have heard of them. But he found it, Humongous. Like he found it, Humongous! <laughs> After working on Zack McCracken in 1988, Gilbert had the inkling of a pirate game in his head. Inspired somewhat by Tim Power's novel On Stranger Tides and by the atmosphere of the Pirates of the Caribbean Disney ride, he began noting down ideas, initially thinking of it as a series of short stories which he presented then to Lucasfilm. So, they immediately got to work on their next big title, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Hold on, did I miss something? Yeah. It took a year for them to actually take on these ideas, but after finishing development on Indy in 1989, work began on a game called Mutiny on Monkey Island. Gilbert brought on board a couple of others to help. Firstly, there was Dave Grossman, who eventually went on to work at Telltale Games, and secondly, Tim Schafer of Double Fine Fame and Infamy. Regardless of what you think of Schafer, he had a big role in making LucasArts what it was. Starting from this game, with their help, Lucasfilm Games developed what would become The Secret of Monkey Island, a nautical coming-of-age tale with its tongue firmly planted in its cheek. And I think that's enough history to help set the context. I mean, there's only so much of a Wikipedia article I can read out before you guys start to call me a hack. I need to actually get on with the game itself. So, without further ado, welcome to The Secret of Monkey Island.
After the intro, the game drops you off on Melee Island with the lookout, and we are introduced to our oddly named protagonist, Guybrush Threepwood. It's an odd name, yeah, but we'll get into that in a bit. Guybrush wants to be a pirate, and that's the only motivation we're given for him to begin with. The senile, mostly blind lookout then points us in the direction of the pirate leader situated at the Scum Bar. Not that we should necessarily trust his sense of direction. Um, I'm over this way. Ah! Anyway, welcome to part one of The Secret of Monkey Island. To reach the scum bar, we walk along the pier, making sure to take note not just of the beautiful blues of the Melee Island Sea and Night Sky, but also the poster for the candidacy of the governor, Elaine Marley. Re-elect Governor Marley. When there's only one candidate, there's only one choice. The scum bar itself is just to the right of the pier. You might be wondering why scum has two M's in the name rather than just one. If you weren't wondering, then I'm going to tell you anyway. That's because it was named after the engine the game runs on, an engine created for Maniac Mansion a few years prior. Script creation utility for Maniac Mansion. Scum. A great acronym and an even better name for a pirate bar. That's destiny right there. Entering the scum bar introduces you to several other characters. First of all, there's this pirate here who thinks that Guybrush's name is hilarious. Guybrush Threepwood? <laughs> That's the stupidest name I've ever heard. Well, what's your name? My name is Mancom Seepgood. Monkey Island knows that Guybrush Threepwood is a silly name. Of course it is. Throughout the entire series, several characters get it constantly wrong as well. Well then, Thriftweed, Guybrush knows here. Listen, Peepwood. But where did the name Guybrush actually come from? You see, during the development of Monkey Island, the sprite for Guybrush was created before his name. This was a sprite called a brush file created by one of the game's artists, Steve Purcell, who you may know as the creator of Sam and Max, and for the amazing box art of Monkey Island's 1, 2, and 5. For a while, this brush file was just a guy. A brush file depicting a guy. A guy brush. It's kind of catchy after a while. As for Threepwood, that name came from an internal vote at LucasArts. Threepwood is derived from the characters of the same surname, such as Freddy Threepwood, from the Blanding series of stories by P.G. Woodhouse. I've never read those books, and if you search for Threepwood now, it just comes up with Guybrush anyway. At the bar, the pirates fill you in on some important backstory for the game. A vicious pirate called LeChuck fell in love with the governor, but the feeling wasn't mutual. In order to prove his love for her in a grand and foolhardy gesture that absolutely nobody asked for, LeChuck set sail for the Lost Sea secret of Monkey Island. He died on the way. But that wasn't the end for old Charlie Boy, oh no. We thought that that was the end of the fearsome pirate, Lechuk. We were wrong. His spirit still haunts the waters in a ghost ship with an undead crew. You could also learn this information from a dog, if you really want. Woof, Lechuk. Woof, 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 <laughs> One of the other pirates in the room is Cobb, taken directly from another LucasArts game called Loom. And with the original EGA graphics of both games, he even uses pretty much the same sprite. Cobb is here in the scum bar to actually advertise Loom as well, which had been released by LucasArts earlier in the same year. Beat the rush! Go out and buy Loom today! Jeez, what an obvious sales pitch. Sorry, but on some topics I just get carried away. But that's enough of the locals. We're here for the pirate leaders, who are these three gentlemen sat drinking grog together at a table. After expressing your piratey aspirations and your special skills, I can hold my breath for 10 minutes. Remember that. The leaders give you three trials to undergo to prove your worth and assess your piratey potentiality. Swordplay, thievery, and the uh, uh, treasure huntery. Sword fighting involves beating the sword master of Melee Island in a duel. Thievery involves stealing an idol from the governor's mansion. And treasure hunting involves finding the lost treasure of the island. It does make me wonder if they're just gatekeeping here. I mean, I don't think all the other pirates would have been able to do that. Some of them are pretty incompetent. Either way, we have a few things to work towards now. We can also insult the pirate leaders if we want. You're a bunch of foul-smelling grog-swilling pigs. To be a pirate, you must also be a foul-smelling, grog-swilling... Uh, big. 
One of the funny things about Monkey Island is you can pretty much say what you want without consequence. I would actually encourage the player to try out different dialogue options simply because this game is so funny. And there might be some hidden gems in there that you'd otherwise miss. Anyway, moving on, let's try and get into the kitchen. There's some surprise tools in there that'll help us later. The chef won't let you win typically, so you have to wait for him to leave and start serving the customers. This time window is actually quite short, so as soon as you hear the door open and he arrives on the left side of the screen, you need to book it to the door as fast as possible. Basically, you have to be like my cat Rosie as soon as I open my bedroom door. Bless her. Once you make it into the kitchen, you can see that the chef has some stuff on the go. But what he's making isn't too important. Grab his meat, apart from beneath the counter, and head outside to the mini pier. Out here, a seagull is feasting on a fish. We need that fish, but the seagull won't let us have it. Okay, buddy. Looks like we're gonna do this the hard way. So you get the metal pot, and then you bludgeon the seagull to death. Uh, no, we don't actually do that. There's a loose board on the pier here, which can be used to propel the seagull away from the fish a couple times. Which gives Guybrush a small window of time to nab it. Also, fun fact about that seagull. According to the game's credits, the seagull also comes from Loom? Huh. Now that we have everything we need from the bar, we can begin the three trials. But not yet. Meanwhile, After leaving the bar, we get a brief aside on a ship docked in the River of Lava, featuring the Gorse Pirate LeChuck and his minion Bob. Don't. It's days like this that make you glad to be dead. Oh, yes sir. Glad to be dead. <laughs> we are also introduced to one of the best villain themes ever here. God, I love LeChuck's theme. I'll talk more about the music later in the video because, God, it's so good. LeChuck hears about Guybrush and, quite sensibly, and merely as a precaution, decides to offer the potentially piratey protagonist himself. So, we had better watch our step. First, let's explore the town a bit. In the clock tower area, there's a shifty looking man willing to sell us a map. As long as we get the code phrase right. This isn't really a puzzle, it's just a bit of fun. Excuse me, but do you have a cousin named Sven? No, but I once had a barber named Dominique. Close enough. Let's talk business. We can't no afford thanks. this map yet though, we'll come back to this guy later. He's important well, then, for the treasure hunting segment of the trials. We also meet a trio of pathetic pirates called the Men of Low Moral Fiber, hey, right. and terrorize them. Do you like rats? Yes, especially in a light wine sauce. Ah, ah, get away! Ah! Yeah, Guybrush can be a bit of a jerk if you want him to be. Remember that, because I'll probably be mentioning it a little bit more when we get to Monkey Island 2. Either way, you don't really need to do a lot with these guys. You can get the minutes of a PTA meeting off them, which isn't really that useful of an item. I think you can set it on fire at some point. So let's go through this door here. This is a pretty important segment of the game. This brings us some slightly spooky music and contains a whole bunch of strange voodoo paraphernalia. Let's see, there's a jar of bat drippings. A box that says assorted scales, a shaker full of monkey flakes, and some cat knuckles. Cat knuckles? How barbaric! Don't listen to them, sweetie. There's also a rubber chicken with a pulley in the middle. Yes, it's important, so we'll be taking it. This voodoo shop turns out to belong to a strange woman who sits on a chair in front of a smoking green pot of stuff. She doesn't have a name, she's known only as the Voodoo Lady, and she appears in every single Monkey Island game to give you some kind of guidance. In this game though, she has a pretty minor role all things considered. You can visit her a couple times throughout the game. She just acts a bit mysterious, reads your mind a bit before you speak, and does some weird magic -y stuff with a skull cauldron. Either way, keep her in mind for future games. The town also contains a shop, a jail, a church, and the governor's mansion, which is guided by ravenous piranha poodles. All of these places will become relevant in due time. Oh, and a bald guy called Festa Shinetop calls into an alley to casually threaten us. Psst. Hello? Anybody in here? Hello? You know, bad things could happen to a person in a dark, deserted alley like this one. And at this time of night, nobody would be around to see it. He's a sheriff around these parts, but do we trust him? Well, if you've got the special edition voiceover, he might just sound a little bit familiar. So that's Melee Town, and with all that covered, let's get back to the trials. 
I'll start with sword fighting since it's probably one of the most iconic parts of this game, and Guybrush needs a couple things beforehand. A sword, and lessons in how to use it. First up, the sword. You can find I this quite mind. simply in the town's general store, Figures. owned by a very ornery shopkeeper. Now how else do you want to waste my time? The only problem is, well, once again, we don't have the money to buy it. Money's going to be a big issue for a couple of these trials, so let's figure out how to get some cash first. And that brings me pretty nicely to this. The island map. This shows everywhere you can go on the island. It's not just the town. There's quite a bit that opens up here. You see, despite this being an adventure game, Ron Gilbert wanted it to feel a little bit like an RPG, so included overhead maps. So if we're going to get some money, we need to go to the area on the map marked as Circus. And true to form, this is one damn fine circus. I love the way the screen scrolls to unveil the tent in the distance. It looks awesome. The pixel art in this game in general is just gorgeous, having been worked on by the aforementioned Steve Purcell, but also Mark Ferrari and Mike Abert. You may have seen Mark Ferrari's work at some point. He did some art for Thimbleweed Park recently, and you may have seen these particular pieces of art before as well. He's an immensely talented guy. Either way, the circus tent contains a pair of bickering Italian brothers. You don't have any allergies, you faker. You get in the cannon! No, you get in the cannon! No, you get in the cannon! Slacker! Loser! Raphael! These are the... Uh, Fettuccine Brothers. Really? The Fettuccine Brothers? I mean, that's like calling them the Pizza Pasta Twins. Or Spaghetti and Meatball. That's us! My brother Alfredo. And my brother Bill. Okay, you know what? That's kind of funny. The two brothers are arguing about a cannon trick they have planned for their act. Neither of them want to try the dangerous stunt, understandably. So as soon as you step in, they immediately accost you and offer you money to test the stunt for them. Of course, it's completely safe, right? There's only a mild chance of death or horrific disfigurement, surely. They won't agree to let you do it unless you have a helmet. But where on earth would you get a safety helmet on this island? Don't worry, Chief. We got you covered already. Remember the pot we picked up in the scum bar? This acts as the perfect safety helmet to use here. Well, not perfect so much as functional. So let's do it. I'm sure Guybrush will be fine. It works! Oh, I'm so relieved. Hey! Are you okay? I'm Bobbin. Are you my mother? He's alright! This right here is actually another Loom reference, by the way. The protagonist of Loom is called Bobbin Threadbear, who, to cut a long story short, is looking for his mother. We may have lost a few brain cells there, but we earned enough money to start a new hobby. Who's the real winner here? With the money, we can get ourselves a sword from the shopkeeper, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can fight with it. You need a teacher! Oh, you can bet, if Monkey Island was still around, they'd be making Kylo Ren references. I'm just here to pick up the slack. The place we find a teacher is here on the map, but we need to cross the bridge first. And appropriately, the bridge has a troll. But you can't just put this troll in a bag. He requires a troll toll. Not in the form of money, though. He wants something that, according to him, I want something that will divert attention from things that are really important. What's so like a like a red herring? Oh, oh, very clever. This is a really cute puzzle that I adore, but I can see it annoying a few people nowadays. If you don't know, a red herring is an idiom typically used in stories to refer to a misleading detail. It points away from where you should be looking. I think it's a funny solution personally, but it operates under the assumption that you already know what a red herring is. And you might not, especially if English isn't your first language. So yeah, it's up to you whether or not you like this puzzle. Once you give the troll a red herring, he takes off a mask, and it's George Lucas. You know, somehow, I always knew that George Lucas would eat the fish raw. He just seems like that kind of guy. Also, you might not quite recognise him with these graphics, but it's much more obvious with the special edition and fully captures that authentic 80s George swoosh. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. That's one of the few hairstyle changes of the special edition that's actually good. Passing the bridge allows us to reach the shack of Captain Smirk, an action hero looking guy who has an eye patch, short cropped white hair and smokes a stogie. Fair to say, he's probably a badass. So maybe he can teach us about being better than the Swordmaster. You? <laughs> you could never be half the sword fighter Carly is. Okay, so maybe you we're a bit of a way work. off, but we need to make a start. So I let's uh, show him our sword. Let's see your sword. Okay, check it out. Yes, this is a nice one. Whew. A bit warm in here, isn't it? 
Oh, goodness me. Smirk explains the basic it's principles of what it means to fight with a sword and puts you up against a training machine. Then, this is where an iconic Monkey Island mechanic Come comes into play. Insult sword fighting. As Smirk says, Sword fighting is kind of like making love. It's not always what you do, but what you say. The way this mechanic works is that there are a set of insults to learn that have set up some responses. And the key to winning a battle is having the right ones to hand. Smirk teaches you a couple of them, including... You fight like a dairy farmer! Like. To which the response is... How appropriate! You fight like a cow! I've been quoting this one ever since I first played it, but there are many, many more to get through. Smirk throws another one your way involving a feather duster, but for the rest, you gotta go out and learn them yourself, against other pirates on the island. And at first, you'll just be losing, because you don't know many insults or responses. Where did my sword go? This is by far the most time-consuming segment of the game. There's a pretty long list of insults to learn, but on your first playthrough, it can be really fun to find them out. Through these sword fights, you'll be given new insult setups and you won't be able to respond at first. I've heard you were a contemptible snake. Oh, yeah? Until you pass those setups onto a pirate who does know them. So you then learn the response to it. I've heard you were a contemptible sneak. Too bad no one's ever heard of you at all. Boom, roasted. Oh, wait, that's me. Yikes. These Errol Flynn-inspired insults were written by Orson Scott Card, who's best known for his Ender's Game books. And also being a huge homophobic jerk, his writing might be good, but screw that guy. I won't waste any time on him. If I'm being perfectly honest, this particular bit of The Secret of Monkey Island drags a bit. On the first playthrough, yeah, it's fine. Especially since you don't know all the insults. Even on the second and maybe third, you might end up hearing a couple of them that you didn't remember or didn't even hear last time. There's about 17 insults in all, and you don't actually need all of them to beat the Swordmaster. However, if you've played this segment multiple times, like I have, then it can feel like a bit of a chore. Even Ron Gilbert agrees with me on this one. In a blog post where he replayed the game, he wrote, I thought it seemed a little tedious, but fun as I played through it again. There is a point where you say, I get it, but you're still forced to go through the motions again and again. So when exactly does it end? How do you know when you know enough insults to fight the Swordmaster? At some point, the pirates will start to tell you. Wow, you're good enough to fight the Swordmaster. In which case, it's now time to actually find Carla the Swordmaster. And as it turns out, the shopkeeper we bought our sword from knows her personally and is willing to ask her to meet up with you. And he's ornery about it, as usual. Hmm, I guess I could hike all the way over there once. I'll be right back. If you do let him try to set up a meeting though, it won't work. He just tells you that she's not interested. The Swordmaster says you can jump in the lake, by the way. What do you want? But if the shopkeeper does know the way there, then maybe, maybe we can just follow him next time. But will he cooperate and ask her again? That's the question. Hmm, I guess I could hike all the way over there again. I'll be right back. Yep, he sure will. <laughs> And now you can pretty much just follow him across the island. It's not difficult at all, and eventually you find him at the house of the Swordmaster. It soon becomes clear that he was never actually asking for anything on your behalf, just making excuses to see Carla, since the lecherous old creep is a thing for her. Face it, you crusty old lech. You'd make any excuse just to come out here and bother me. Yeah, I guess so. Well, cut it out. I'm sick of it. Take a hike and don't come out here again. Someone might follow you, and then I'd become another Melee Island tourist attraction. Hey, it's your loss, baby. Yeah. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. As well as being an honorary shopkeeper, he's also somewhat of a, a horny shopkeeper. He's, um, hornery. Yep, that's a good joke. Don't need to rewrite that one. Still, now that we've found the Swordmaster, we can attempt to take her on in a sword fight. She I really like Carla here. Anything. She's pretty much just tired of everyone's nonsense. How dare you approach the Swordmaster without permission, which I surely didn't give you. I can tell by the sarcastic expression on your face that you've been fully trained by Captain Smirk. Let's get this over with. Something that you'll immediately notice with this fight is that she uses her own set of insults. This can really throw you at first, because you haven't prepared for these setups at all. Like, was I supposed to learn these? Oh god, I don't know how to respond at all. Breathe. Just think about it for a moment. No, these insults cannot be learned from anyone but Carla. However, the responses you've learned for all the other insults are actually usable here. And with a clever bit of wordplay, 
you can come up with an appropriate response using what you have already. It's a very satisfying end to the insult sword fighting puzzle, as it's actually a puzzle, rather than just grinding for different voice lines. Something I didn't mention before is how the voice changes when you get a response wrong or right. This is entirely unique to the special edition's voiceover, and it's a nice touch. When you use a correct response, Guybrush sounds triumphant. Why, did you want to borrow one? However, if it's not correct, Guybrush sounds a lot more uncertain. I love the delivery of these particular versions of the lines as well. Why? Did you want to borrow one? It may take a couple of attempts and extra insult learning, but eventually you'll have figured out enough responses to beat her, and she then gives you something to prove that you bested her. It says, I beat the Swordmaster. And that's the first trial completed, but we still have a long way to go. So, who's up for a bit of thievery? Let's make the guy from Thief proud. What was he called again? Garrett. Let's make Garrett proud. We already established where the governor's mansion is earlier, and the Piranha Poodle guards. We ain't getting in without dealing with them first. So, who's up for poisoning some dogs? That's always a fun activity. No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. It's not actual poison. You just ply a slab of meat with a mysterious flower and feed it to them. It's fine. Again, they're fine. Th this is fine. Important notice. These dogs are not dead. They are only sleeping. No animals were harmed during the production of this game. The solution to this puzzle might seem a little obtuse at first. I mean, why that flower in particular? Something I didn't know for a long time is that the answer is actually given to it by a prisoner in the jail. He mentions the yellow flowers in the forest being illegal to pick and being called Kanish Andormi. Hold on a second. Ah, well, what do you know? That actually translates to sleeping poodle. Neat. What follows is a fully automated sequence in the mansion where Guybrush has a fight with Festus Shinetop. It's a good comedic bit, if a little bit on the long side. The comedy mostly comes from the implications of everything happening through the game's interface and the verb system. Oh god, how do I get this far in the video without mentioning the verbs? I'm a big advocate of verbs in adventure games, as long time fans of the channel may well be aware. Okay, so interface wise, the first thing I notice is verbs, and let me tell you, I love me some verbs in adventure games. But this right here, this is one of the most iconic examples, and one of the first. Yeah, others got there first, including a few of the LucasArts titles, and yeah, they didn't look this nice until the CD re-release. But this really solidified a great look for verb interfaces going forward. There are other companies who even chose to steal it simply because it worked so well. It's so simple. No more guessing which word to type in a parser, just select a verb and click on the object you want to interact with. I'm personally a fan of the whole system, but I know that Ron Gilbert thinks they're a little bit antiquated nowadays and turn people off. I guess that's fair. You only really need luck, use and walk in an adventure game. Yeah, it probably is better game design to streamline things a little bit, but I can't help but be charmed by verbs. I mean, it's like they used charm on my heart. They're well utilized in Monkey Island, but I think this automated sequence in the mansion highlights just how funny they can be. Some really amusing things can come out of this system. One of my favorites happens much later in the game if you click on the sun. Oh, sure. Walk to the sun. After scrapping with Festa for a while, trashing up the mansion for a bit, and acquiring some random and strange items like gopher repellent. Gopher repellent? Guybrush locks a suspicious sheriff up. However, we're lacking one item we need to get the idol, a file. And I'm talking about the metal scrapey kind of file, not the document kind. So where could Guybrush get one of those? The best practice here is to kind of go for a word association game. Files, often hidden in cakes, to break people out of prison. I don't think that's actually a thing that happens in real life, but hey, it's a trope. The thing about Monkey Island is that it's in the business of inverting these sorts of tropes. So what if it's not a file in a cake that we need to get into the prison, but one that we actually need to get out of the prison. The Melee Island Jail contains Otis, the prisoner we mentioned earlier. Otis is a petty criminal who has been eating rats. In fact, his breath smells so bad we can't even talk to him at first until we give him a breath mint from the store. I could really use a breath mint. Whew, you're telling me. Here, take one. Please, take the whole roll. I mean, rude. We can't really blame him. I mean, Otis had nothing to eat in his cell other than the rats. Well, except for the carrot cake that his Aunt Tilly made for him. Wait, so this guy would rather eat rats than carrot cake? I actually really like carrot cake. A am I alone in this? He'd be willing to trade his cake if we gave him something to get rid of the rats, which are his only other food source. This guy might not be the smartest in town. I think eating rats might have smoothed this guy's brain down a bit. The gopher repellent we picked up in the mansion works just fine here. And in return, we get the cake, which of course contains the file we need to get the idol we need from the mansion. Phew, that was a close one. Unfortunately, Fester accosts Guybrush after this, demanding an explanation for all the things he's done. 
To be fair, drinking the governor's pet poodles and then committing a BNA is pretty hard to explain, especially when you actually did do those things. We can say it's not what it looks like all we want, because what it looks like is pretty much actually what we did. Either way, the governor intervenes and we finally get to meet the woman in charge. I'm Governor Marley. Governor Elaine Marley. And Guybrush is, uh, uh, smitten Relax, and lost Mr. for words, Kipwood. to say the least. I know why you're here. Golly! She does butter him up a bit, to be fair. Tell me, Guybrush, why do you want to be a pirate? You don't look like one. Your face is too... sweet. Boof. I see. Yeah. Boof. Twinkly? <sighs> I really wish I knew how to talk to women. With Guybrush distracted and Elaine off doing something else, Fester is then able to get the drop on us, You're taking Guybrush to the pier, tying the idol to him, over. and, well... My plans for the governor are far too important and much too near completion to risk letting a would-be pirate like you get in the way. So long, Mr. Spice Cake or Droop Face or whatever your name is. Hmm. This might actually turn out to be a pretty good day. If it's not obvious by now, Festa is LeChuck. Though this isn't confirmed until a later cutscene. There are plenty of hints beforehand though. For instance, Elaine mentions that he's a new sheriff, for example. The previous sheriff mysteriously disappeared according to Otis. And the fact that he had plans for the governor, it's all quite obvious in hindsight. I mean hell, with the 2009 voice acting, Earl Bourne voices both LeChuck and Shine Top. You can't miss it. So, where were we? Alright. Drowning. Tied down by the idol, Guybrush can't go far without being held back by the rope. The game cruelly tantalizes you here as well by having all manner of sharp objects around you. If we could only just reach them. There's stuff like these guys on the pier as well to twist the knife further. God, no, I'm just tormenting myself. Also, the delivery of these guys' lines reminds me a lot of Oblivion NPCs talking to each other. Hey, Nick. I just committed a felony. Did it involve that big knife you've got there? <laughs> yeah. What should I do with it? Well, get rid of it. Eh, I might need it. See ya. See ya. To top it all off, your sword is confiscated here as well, if you have one at this point. So, the game taunts you with sharp objects just out of your reach that could potentially cut the rope. But can you actually drown here? You might be aware that LucasArts games tended not to have game overs in them once they hit the 90s. This is the one exception in this particular game. Earlier in the video, I brought your attention to Guybrush noting one of his special skills, as you may recall. I can hold my breath for 10 minutes. And if you actually wait 10 minutes down there, this is the one way Guybrush can die in the Monkey Island series. Well, there is that other thing later on, which doesn't really count. Ah, we'll get there eventually. Once Guybrush finally croaks it, the verb table actually changes too. It's just one of those extra amusing details that makes me love this game all the more. Oh wow, remember when games had hymn books? I actually don't. I was born in 1997, so I don't really know anything about that. In the end, how do you avoid death and actually get out of this watery grave? Believe it or not, it's really simple. We already picked up the idol earlier. It's not heavy. Therefore, Guybrush can just pick it up and you can be on your way. The sharp objects, they're a red herring. Ah, a red herring. Do you see how it all comes together now? That one troll red herring puzzle sets the tone for the whole game here. Sometimes Monkey Island will misdirect you on purpose. You've got to be prepared for that. It's not unreasonable though. It gives you everything you need to figure out the answer yourself, but also it trips you up and laughs at you in the process. Is that a satisfying way to build an adventure game? Uh, that's up to you, but I love it. After Guybrush frees himself from his bonds, he runs into Elaine on the pier, who discovers Guybrush is capable of using human words to communicate instead of the language of a cat laying on a keyboard. Governor! Hey, you can talk. <laughs> Who'd have known? The two then realise that they have feelings for each other, and the score sweeps into this romantic ballad, and they come up with all manner of pet names with each other on the spot. I always found it just a bit strange that Elaine would bother herself with Guybrush at all, but you kind of have to realise that she's always surrounded by pirates. And this guy is pretty much the direct opposite of a pirate, even if he wants to be one for some reason. It's almost like Guybrush is just a kid at a carnival, playing pretend. I 
think it's the fact that Guybrush is very much not a pirate that draws Elaine in. Although I do think that Guybrush is implied to be around maybe 17 in this game, and she's an elected official, a politician, so probably a fair few years older. Now, I'm not trying to imply anything here, but... Regardless, Elaine stops Guybrush and encourages him to finish up the three trials before he... Um, gives his uh, meat to her piranha poodle. Oh. I feel this sudden urge to complete the trials. Quickly. All this excitement, and I forgot about the trials, actually. So back to the task at hand, we now have our idol, which means we only have one trial remaining before we can officially become a pirate. So let's go a treasure hunting. Every good treasure hunter needs a shovel. And much like the sword, we can get one of those from the shopkeeper. Oh, it'll pay for itself, believe me. Yeah, you'll dig up 75 pieces of eight in no time. But hey, save some treasure for the rest of us, would you? <laughs> oh my god, this guy sucks. Don't you have like a heart attack scheduled or something? You may also remember the shifty looking man willing to sell us a map in town. This is what we'll need here to find our treasure. Pay him the money, get the map, and hey, wait a minute, these are just dance instructions. So have we been ripped off here? Did we just get scammed? No. These are the directions. They're mostly straightforward, but back here actually means up. It doesn't tell you that. You can then make your way through the forest using dance moves and find the treasure in no time. Probably the simplest trial. I do want to mention one random side note about the forest though, because I probably won't find any other relevant place to mention this. In earlier versions of the game, there was a tree stump, which would prompt the user to insert discs 22, 36 and 114, to which Guybrush responds that obviously, as a result, he can't go that way. The game only came with eight discs initially, so it's pretty clearly just a joke. Some people didn't get the joke. They actually called in a LucasArts to ask where their missing discs were. They removed the joke in later versions of the game. That didn't stop LucasArts from lampshading this whole situation later down the line though. But once again, we'll get there in due time. Anyway, once we dig up the lost treasure of Melee Island, it turns out to be... another t-shirt. Huh. But that's it. That's all the proof we need. And we just need to get down to the scum bars so we can... Oh no. What was that? The lookout That's comes so down to tell us that Elaine has been hey, kidnapped and taken to Monkey Island. Her. And we need to do something about that, since nobody else here has the guts for it. On. Oh, also, LeChuck leaves a ransom note. Attention, pirates of Melee. Your governor is alive and well and by my side as she was always meant to be. If you try to find us, you will only meet with horrifying disaster. Yours truly, Captain LeChuck. Well, at least he's polite about it. There's an area of the map you might have come across at this point which hasn't had any use as of yet, which is Stan's previously owned vessels. If you go there before completing the trials, Welcome there's not a lot going on there. Afterwards, however, the used vessel salesman I'm Stan shows up to right peddle his wares to you, and Stan is pretty much taking a used car salesman character and pushing him to the nth the degree. Right. God, right I love him. Howdy! I'm Stan of Stan's previously owned vessels, and I'd stand on my head to make you a deal. What sort of craft are you looking for? Big? Little? Fast? Slow? You want it? I got it. This is the alpha salesman right here. The eye-catching coat, the wild, ever-present and off-kilter gesticulations, the smooth voice. This guy has it all. Great! He could sell your own house back to you and you'd do it with a smile. Okay, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration. All in all, Stan is actually a little bit pathetic. He's more of a wacky inflatable tube man than a pro salesman. But I adore him, he's a very fun character and it's a delight whenever he turns up. We Stan Stan. The pattern of the court is also... mesmerizing. I, I can't look away. It stays the same. However you look at him and just... Oh, dude. Is using hypnosis ethical for a salesman? Stan is willing to sell us a ship, but we don't have nearly enough cash to pay for it. We can get credit from the shopkeeper, but we need a job for that, and Guybrush is woefully unemployed. I'm not sure pirate counts as a career path. Luckily, you can just lie about it. Lying is a core mechanic in Monkey Island. 
The shopkeeper keeps his credit slip in this vault, see? And you can gain access to it whenever you send him on a trip to see Carla. But we'll need to learn the combination for that safe, so tell the shopkeeper we have a job and that we want credit. Pay very close attention to the combination on the safe and maybe write it down. It's different every time you play. When he leaves again, grab the credit and hightail it out of there. This credit can only get you so far at stands, so just haggle him out with a few extras and he's willing to hand it over. But wait, there's more! Did I tell you about the elevator made with wood from burgundy wine casks? I think I can live without that particular piece of junk. Yeah, I guess that is kind of decadent, isn't it? He also gives you some leaflets about various things such as navigation and a magnetic compass. Handy. So now we have a ship, we just need a crew. We can't sail solo. You need three people to join you overall, two of whom we've already met in our adventure in the Three Trials. Carla is a fiercely competent fighter, so naturally she'd be an asset to the team, and she's easy to convince. Just tell her the governor is in danger and she's in. Hmm... I have a feeling I'm going to regret this, but count me in. That leaves us with two others to find. The men of low moral fiber are too cowardly to join you, and the chef is too busy crying alone, so the next option is Otis, who is still in jail. If I let you out, would you join my crew? Sure! Of course! To my emancipator, I shall be eternally indebted. Until then, I pace. Considering the sheriff is now out of commission because, well, he's LeChuck, and the governor's out of commission because, well, she's a hostage, we can actually break him out of jail. How, you may ask? Well, you toss some grog from the scum bar on the lock. Grog steadily melts through the metal cups though because they're such a vile caustic substance. So you have to transfer your grog between a few mugs to make sure you don't lose it. It's a great puzzle and pretty logical. Even if it's something you overlook, it seems obvious in hindsight, which is a sign of a good puzzle, I think. A good puzzle should make you think, I should have thought of that, rather than, how could I possibly have thought of that? You may be wondering how you could possibly even know to use grog in the first place. Well, early on in the game, you can actually ask the pirate leaders what's in the grog. Grog is a secret mixture which contains one or more of the following. Kerosene, propylene glycol, artificial sweeteners, sulfuric acid, rum, acetone, red dye number two, scum, axle grease, battery acid, and or pepperoni. See, I think it's the pepperoni that does it in the end. Pepperoni has always been known to break other people out of jail. I mean, have you played Lego Island? Also, this is the second time I've referenced the Lego Island pizza jailbreak in the past couple of videos. It's just constantly appropriate somehow. After freeing Otis, he pretty much just blows us off. I'm free! Oh yeah, thanks. Sucker! <laughs> but... But don't worry, he'll be back. Right? I'm sure he'll be back. He gave me his word as a pirate. Our last would-be crewman is a character we haven't technically met yet. You might have noticed an island across a zip line at some point. And remember that rubber chicken we picked up at the voodoo lady's place? The one with the pulley in the middle? This is actually what you use here to head across to his house. You can actually head there during the three trials, but you can't really do a lot else there. But this is where we'll find our third crew member. This is Meat Hook. And despite his rather threatening name and the fact that he has hooks for hands, he's actually quite pleasant. <laughs> hey! You've got a pretty good sense of humour! Ha! Wanna say something really funny? Ha! Oh, and he can make his tattoo talk. It's it's a whole thing. Ha <laughs> ha! Watch this. Say hello, Roger! Hello, Roger! Yep. In order to get Meathook to join you, he tasks you with facing a horrible beast. After unleashing it from behind several doors, Guybrush stares into the eyes of a horrific creature, hell-bent on destruction and... Oh, it's a parrot. Yep. I actually really love how this sequence looks with the 256 color graphics. The realism and the reflection in Guybrush's eyes really create a moment of true tension here. And then the rug is pulled out from under here as we found out the truth. It's great. This is actually part of why I prefer these graphics to the special edition. I feel like with that style, you lose that juxtaposition between realism and silliness. Maybe I'm picky. Maybe it's just me. I just think Monkey Island's at its best when it has a slightly gritty edge alongside the silliness. And with Guybrush's display of... <clears throat> bravery, Meathook is willing to join the crew. Oh, come on, Meathook. You're a big, strong, good-looking guy with a talking tattoo. You can swab my decks anytime. Really? With all three crew members recruited and a ship procured, it's time to set sail for Monkey Island. But not before Stan changes his mind and tries to take back the so ship, until... Dear. Then again, 
A deal's a deal, right? Right. Catch you later. Slime ball. <laughs> Good luck, um. The three recruits, including Otis, turn up at this Boy, point and start boy. asking questions. Well, it soon becomes clear that Guybrush might just be out of his bags. depth for the ship's captain. What's going on here? Where's our ship? Where's our crew? This isn't going to be as easy as I thought. Part 2 is called The Journey, and as you might expect, this is about the journey to Monkey Island. It's a relatively short chapter of the game, all things considered, and probably one of the least memorable parts. That's not to say that it's bad in any way though, it's a fun little detour between the more significant segments of the game. It's just a bit of breathing room, really. For this segment of the game, the crew essentially mutiny against Guybrush with the argument that the governor can probably take care of herself. I don't exactly think they're wrong, but it's still, as one might say, a dick move. Because without a cooperative crew, we can't make it to Monkey Island. Or can we? The ship sold to us, the Spider Monkey, is said to have made it to Monkey Island in a previous voyage. And you hear rumours on Melee that it might have made its way back there manned only by a crew of monkeys. Why, there's a story around these parts that a bunch of rats actually crewed a ship here from Fable the Monkey Island. No, that's not right. It was actually a group of monkeys. Their fate? A mystery. Almost as mysterious as how this ship returned to Melee Island without a single human aboard. Some claim it was sailed back by a crew of chimps. That might explain why it's falling apart, to be fair. But it also means that there's evidence of the previous human crew who made their way to Monkey Island before. So how did they do it? From a journal on the desk, we discovered they had a first mate called Herman Toothrot, who gradually drove him up the wall by being annoying. Captain's Log, March 12th. I wish Toothrot would take a bath. Well, I sure hope we don't run into him then. More crucially, we find some directions to Monkey Island. This introduces a concept which is used in pretty much every game in the series. Recipes because the directions are in the form of a recipe. Generally, you just need to gather a selection of ingredients, making do where necessary. The cinnamon stick is the only direct item on this as you can actually find though. The rest, you kind of have to improvise. For the leaves of mint, we already have some breath mints from earlier, so they work fine. The pressed human skull sounds pretty tricky to procure, but you just need to remember that you're on a pirate ship. What do pirate ships always have? A skull and crossbones flag. Technically, a pressed human skull, because it's a flat image. The squirt of squid ink, pen ink works fine too. Two pints of monkey blood, you can use wine. A live chicken, well, we've got a rubber one with a pulley in the middle. And brimstone is simply gunpowder. As for the last item on the list, it sounds a bit similar to what was in Grog. So maybe the pirate cereal also contains stuff like that. So the box of cereal is the last ingredient. A lot of these depend on wordplay, finding the closest associated item or hints from earlier in the game. Again, this might annoy a few people. I personally really like it. It feels like you have to use your brain a little bit more than just following the instructions directly. I think it's better that way. Once he mixes up all the necessary ingredients in the kitchen's cooking pot, Guybrush promptly passes out from the fumes. Oh, I think I'm getting dizzy. Overcome by the fumes and stench, Guybrush quickly loses consciousness. Poor guy. Why too hard on voodoo spells? Don't do that, kids. You'll go to hell before you die. Anyway, once Guybrush awakens days later, the ship has finally made it to Monkey Island. The crew is still apathetic. Honestly, I expected better of them. Well, I expected better of Carla. The other two are a petty criminal who eats rats and a man with hook hands, a talking tattoo, and a crippling fear of birds. <laughs> Given that the robots were lost to the ship's previous voyage, we also need to wait over there. Fortunately, we already learned a more explosive method of travel back on Melee Island. That's right, we're getting fired out of a cannon again. Of course, you need another pot from the kitchen first. Safety is very important. And you need to get the cannon ready by adding a fuse and some gunpowder and lighting something on fire to get the fuse going. Either way, we're headed to Monkey Island.
Guybrush lands on the shore of the island with his butt ever so slightly on fire and his head stuck in the ground. A monkey eyes him curiously before running off, and a strange hermit approaches. Hi! I'm Herman Toothrot! Oh no. Don't bother to say hello. I've only been waiting 20 years to talk to somebody civilized. I don't mind. Herman Toothrot is a local to Monkey Island, but not by choice. You might remember him being the annoying crewmate mentioned in the journal of the previous captain of the Spider Monkey. I wonder where he's been for the last 20 years then. Maybe he's here too. Ah. I would say that the wrong Gilbert era of Monkey Island had a lot more dark humor like this. You could probably say it was a lot meaner, perhaps? I'm not saying that as a slight, just as an observation. I think the slight cruel streak is an important part of its early identity. Once you get to the third game and beyond, it doesn't have quite the same bite that it does here. Maybe that's for the best, hard to say. This section of the game has you exploring the island of Monkey Island, which is mostly covered in dense jungle and some rocky cliffs. Rocky cliffs, rocky cliffs, rocky cliffs, rocky... <laughs> It can be a little bit tricky to see all the places you can actually go, especially as there are sub-locations such as the fort, which isn't really marked on the map very well, unless you hover over it. And you wouldn't really think that was a place you could even get to, so why would you hover your mouse there in the first place? A minor gripe, but a gripe nonetheless. Guybrush can move a little slowly on this map as well, but this is easily mitigated by clicking on an actual location or a screen change zone. This is especially useful when you eventually get the robot, because otherwise that thing is slow. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, because so far we only have a single side of the island to work on. There are a few different places to explore, but primarily we'll need to get inside the giant monkey head. What giant monkey head I hear you ask? Well, this giant monkey head. Why, that's the second biggest monkey head I've ever seen. But let's back up a bit again. How do we get there? There's a lever which opens up the area, but it needs to be held down, which we can't do alone. If only we had a co-op partner with us. An intelligent being, capable of rational thought. That, of course, eliminates Herman Toothrot, so let's get the monkey to help us instead. It's pretty obvious that monkeys love bananas, and perhaps if we bribe the monkey enough, he'll come to our aid. All in all, you'll need five bananas here. You can give him less, but he won't follow you all the way to the monkey head. Where to start then? Well, there's a banana tree on the beach with a single banana on the floor. So that's one out of five. If only there was a way we could knock some more down. Well, fear not, because there's this contraption here. It activates by pushing a rock from the top of the mountain onto it. Before we do though, it's time for another quick chat with Herman. He appears to you as you visit each area for the first time, commenting on things or telling the story of his voyage a bit more. A joke about him being annoying, but I do quite like Herman as a character, at least in this game. Herman may have lost his mind a little bit, but he also has some great moments of dry humour and sarcasm. Are you some kind of a castaway? What do I look like? The caretaker? <laughs> Listen to this guy. Am I some kind of castaway? Ha! Ah, I never get tired of this view, even if I have been looking at it for 20 years now. Even if it is the only view on the island. Oh, fine. Don't rescue me. I like it here. The rain on my head, the wind at my back, the bugs on my plate. Um, all right then. Let's just check if there's anything interesting to the right here. Oh no, I didn't save the game. Oh no. Rubber tree. Yeah, you can definitely see what Monkey Island was doing here. Most yeah, adventure games I at this point were characterized by their brutal difficulty and many, many unfair deaths. You have to remember that Monkey Island 1 came out in the same year as King's Quest 5 to position it in the market a little bit. That game's brutal as well. Thanks for playing King's Quest V. Look, I love King's Quest V, you know I do. I even did a video defending it, but you gotta admit that Sierra could be straight up mean at times. The way the secret of Monkey Island pokes fun at these silly deaths is integral to the game's design. What Monkey Island said was, hey, adventure games don't have to be like this. They don't have to throw unfair dead ends and deaths at you. They can be challenging and exciting without worrying about losing hours of progress to something you couldn't have possibly seen coming. That's a pretty big statement to make, electing to burn the genre down and build it back up from scratch. Especially when you're firing shots with a fake death screen resembling Sierra's. Either way, the reason we're up here in the first place is the rock catapult. Pushing rocks onto it sends them flying. I wonder if we can hit the banana tree from here. Whoops. That's not the banana tree. Oh, I adore this joke, and it's still funny to see people reacting to this years later. Whoops. Oh, 
okay then. Well, we might have just murdered three people, only one of whom probably deserved it. We also have no way home, but that's a later problem. The now problem is getting banana. So let's pivot this bad boy a bit. Push another rock and voila, more bananas. Don't even need to worry about the potential triple homicide we just committed. That still only gives us an extra two bananas though. Remember we're gonna need five here. So two more are still needed and there aren't any more on this side of the island. Essentially at this point we'll need a robot to access the other half. But first we need to get these oars down here. Right now though, the rope we have isn't quite long enough to get down there. Where can we get more rope then? Oh, oh god. Oh no. Oh, I'm so sorry. I I needed to file your hanging corpse. Is, is that okay? Is that bad karma? I'm sorry. Monkey Island is the prime example of adventure games where the protagonist is a horrible sociopath who'll do anything to get the items he needs. No respect from Guybrush Streetwood. This guy is stone cold. To get this rope from the body, you need to use some gunpowder from the fort's cannon. In order to blow up the dam near the stream, pushing the water down to where the captain died allowing you to grab some rope. Finally, we can make our merry way to the other side on a quest for extra bananas. The robot could feel really slow, but like I mentioned earlier, clicking on the screen change area makes you move faster. It really speeds things up. There's not a huge amount else on the other side, even if it feels like there probably should be more. But crucially, you can access the cannibal village, the very same cannibal village that Herman has had a bit of a feud with. Something I haven't mentioned about the Monkey Island segment of this game is that there are basically three factions squabbling over petty things here. You've got the native cannibals, Lechuk and his ghost pirates, and Herman. <laughs> there are strongly worded letters scattered throughout the island, detailing why they're all very displeased with each other. I just love how it's worded more like disgruntled neighbors who are complaining about a shared fence more than anything else. Uh, do a lap without me. I need to talk to Larry about an issue with our shared fence. Larry, I need to talk to you about an issue with our shared fence. Yes, I also need to discuss this shared fence issue with you. Okay. To the Monkey Island Cannibals. I don't mind you worshipping in front of the sacred monkey idol which doubles as my home and secret base of operations, but could you please refrain from leaving messy sacrifices on my porch? Also, please do not enter the monkey head. GP LeChuck Either way, this cannibal village has Herman's banana picker, and they won't give it back to him unless he returns the key to the monkey head. Oh yeah, Herman has the key to the monkey head. We'll need to get that, but we need to get past this gate first. You know what I always say, bananas first, politics later. The remaining bananas can actually be found in the cannibal village as they have a fruit bowl. Wait, the cannibals have a fruit bowl? I suppose it's not that often that people turn up on the island to be fair. Or maybe it's a part of a balanced diet. I mean their cannibalism no choices way. are ghost and an old man you can just tell will be pretty mealy. I would not eat Herman Toothrot. What were we talking about again? After attempting to leave the village, the cannibals catch you. Oddly, mm, well-spoken cannibals are. who are played a little bit camp in the special edition voiceover for some reason. Is that a banana in your pocket, or are you just glad to see us? You've got a lot of nerve stealing from the notorious Monkey Island cannibals. You're cannibals? I have questions? Yes. Either way, I try to distract them by claiming there's a three-headed monkey behind them, but it doesn't quite work. We get another opportunity to justify ourselves, but oh my god, guys, for real, there's a three-headed monkey this time. Like, actually! Look behind you! A three-headed monkey! Ha! We're not going to fall for that old trick again. I guess we'll eat you now. Tragically, we've blown any trust we could have had with these guys. And this specimen remains unseen to anyone but Guybrush. I do love this gag, but it's not even the best gag in the cannibal village. After you're unable to offer the cannibals anything to bargain for your release, they lock you up in a hut. That should do it. Inside here is the banana picker belonging to Herman. That's good. But we are locked in. Ooh, that's bad. There's also a loose plank that allows us to escape. That's good. Unfortunately, the banana picker is too large to go through the small gap. That's bad. Can I go now? You might be inclined to think that we'd use the picker for our own banana requirements. But don't forget the red herring design philosophy. The one item specifically intended for banana picking is not used to pick bananas. Either way, we can't get it just yet. We'll have to find an alternative means of fetching this device. In the meantime though, let's sneak out of the cannibal village and sneak back in. Now then, how did you break out of our hut and why did you come back? Well, first of all, I'm not telling you. And secondly, it's funny. Every time you escape and re-enter the village, the cannibals add an extra layer of security to the hut's door, eventually culminating in... That should do it. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> It's not necessarily a joke that everyone will come across, but I love it, and I'll do it every single time. An oversight on the cannibals' behalf is the fact that they don't confiscate my bananas. 
Wow, that sure is a sentence I just said. But what this does mean is we finally have enough bananas to get this monkey to follow us. Well, we would if he would get off the damn trees. Not until he comes down. Once you've fed the scamp, take him to the monkey head and show him how it's done. He'll mimic you exactly and, um, stay there for the rest of the game. Eh, fine by me. I can't get in the way of his hobbies. We can't get into the monkey head just yet because we need the key, but we do need something from here. The cannibals mention that something they're after is offerings to give to the monkey head itself. Quite simply, give them one of their own offerings back. They have no idea you've taken it. It's a genius business plan. Also, there's Sam and Max. Once you take the small idol, all you need to do is get captured and give it to the cannibals. Hey, wow, this is impressive. Lemonhead, take a look at this. And it says, made by Lemonhead, just like one of mine. Oh, I love this game. With this gift, the cannibals then owe us a favor, or at least they think they do, which is good enough for a sociopath like Threepwood. We'll cash in that favor in a short while, but this also means that the hut door is now open. And that means we can finally take the banana picker back to Herman and trade it for the key to the monkey head. Which I suppose we could give back to the cannibals. Okay. Nah. So let's crack open this simian similitude and find ourselves a governor. The key, as it turns out, is a giant Q-tip that goes in the ear. It's cute. Climbing down the neck vertebrae leads us to a hellish cavern. And remember the skeleton beneath the monkey head? Somewhere down the line, I'm gonna make a very angry point about retcons and these bones are an integral point in that argument. Anyway. I had a feeling that in hell, there would be mushrooms. This line came from Tim Schafer because he hates mushrooms. I find that pretty funny. The pixel art here in the hell areas is gorgeous, and I adore the grotesque, screaming faces in the walls. The special edition of the game doesn't capture those even 1% as spooky. It does manage to sneak Manny Calavera in there though, so that is something. The original art is like right over classic Doom game. I love it. I think that Monkey Island should be willing to be a bit spooky sometimes. As it currently stands, we're unable to make it through this maze of catacombs. It's constantly changing and shifting, almost making the island itself appear to be alive. You can find giant hearts embedded in the walls and rotten heads growing from the floor. It's some pretty nice and unexpected body horror. To get through this cave system, we're gonna need some directions. Perhaps this is something the cannibals can help us with. You'd never find your way through the catacombs without the- Hey, Ixnay on the Edhe of the Avigator Nay. The what? Nothing. Nothing. Why are you guys talking in pig Latin? So, they won't give up their, um, head of the navigator without a replacement, which apparently belonged to a real navigator. So is this like a metaphorical thing, or... Oh god, no. Oh look! I think he likes you! I really hope he doesn't. And yep, that sure is a head with a necklace of eyeballs on it. A necklace which apparently stops ghosts from seeing the wearer. That's handy, I suppose. So how can we get this head? One of the pamphlets that Stan gives Guybrush after purchasing the ship is called How to Get a Head in Navigating. The cannibals think it'll lead them to a new head, so they're actually willing to trade it for the one they've got. Another fun wordplay puzzle. I do like those. Around this point, the cannibals will also mention a voodoo antidote that LeChuck stole from them. It's also in one of the letters scattered around from earlier, but they expand upon that here. Basically, there's a voodoo root which, when turned into root beer, is capable of killing ghosts. There's only one of these roots in existence, so to make sure no one got the better of him, the ghost pirate LeChuck took it and locked it up tight. I mean, that's smart, that's sensible, but now I know where to get it. And now that we've literally got a head in navigating, we can traverse the hell maze. The head points you in the direction needed. Just stop at any point and he'll rotate himself to the appropriate section. Don't worry if the scenery starts shifting around you, you'll still end up where you need to be pretty soon. The ghost ship of LeChuck. Uh, I've come to interrogate the prisoner. Yikes. Okay, so it's not that easy to just get on. I mean, it's a little bit awkward being the only living human at a dead man's party. Remember the necklace of eyeballs that makes the wearer invisible to ghosts? Yeah, we need that. The head won't give it up easily, though. May I please have that necklace? No, but thanks for asking so politely. There are two approaches here. You can either beg and whine for it. Pretty, pretty please. You can beg all you want, but you can't have it. Pretty please with sugar on top. Oh, all right, you big baby. You can have it. Or you could just threaten him. If I wanted to, I could dropkick you into the lava. On second thought, hey, what good's a necklace if you don't have shoulders? 
Either way, he'll let you have it if you harass him enough. This is true of a lot of things. Just harass people. You can get anything you want. With the necklace, Guybrush can investigate the ship unhindered. And there's something quite funny about basically being a ghost on a ghost ship. It's a fun role reversal there. I've always loved the music in this segment. Hell, the music in the whole game is wonderful. It's actually used surprisingly sparingly. Melee Island especially can feel very quiet. But when that music hits, oh, it hits good. I mentioned LeChuck's theme earlier, but I have to hand it to the ghost ship shuffle in this one. It's really creepy and fun, and I've used it in a few videos myself. The music in The Secret of Monkey Island was composed by Michael Land, and God does he nail it. Every single song on the soundtrack manages to be a catchy classic, from the sneaky theme when you're following the shopkeeper, to the slightly spooky theme of the voodoo lady, Stan's theme is great. Back on the ghost ship, ignore the dancing ghost band. You can try to sneak through the door on the right, but it's a little bit too creaky and it disturbs the other ghosts. Alright, we'll come back once we can deal with that. What you do want to do is use the magnetic compass that Stan gave you to grab the metal key from the Chuck's room. Guy, if you try and approach the key dead. otherwise, he'll just hear you and start shouting. Fear for thy life, ye who enters. The ship sounds strange in these waters. Below a deck, there's a sleeping ghost pirate. Do ghosts need sleep? And how is he sleeping with that racket upstairs? Many questions here, probably answered by the fact that he's holding some grog. And if we want that, we'll need to head further into the ship and grab a ghostly feather from a ghostly chicken. And try not to get too freaked out by these ghostly pigs. They're a bit eerie. There's also a mystical glowing ghost crate we can't get into right now. If only we had a ghost crowbar of some kind. Where's Gordon Phantom when you need him? Tickle the ghost feet with the ghost feather and we now have some ghost grog. The ghost key we nabbed from the ghost pirate LeChuck opens a ghost hatch near the ghost animal pens, where we can find a big vat of grease. Just regular grease. Though Guybrush is too afraid to go past this rat. It's okay. Just get him drunk on Grog, and possibly kill him. Hard to say, Guybrush's kill count may yet be increasing. So finally, we can now stop that door upstairs from creaking. There's not actually a lot in here, but we do finally grab some ghost tools to open that ghost crate, which gives us the voodoo anti-root. Oh, and an Indiana Jones jingle. The Secret of Monkey Island was a Lucasfilm game, and they were always keen to reference other Lucas properties like Indiana Jones or even George Lucas himself like we saw earlier. We'll be seeing a lot of these as we progress through the series, so get ready for that. Now this is the cup of a carpenter. Of course, Star Wars has plenty throughout the series too. It's a bit more subtle in Monkey Island 1 though. Did you come in the ship I saw out there? You're braver than you look. You came nothing? You're braver than I thought. Nice, come on. <laughs> We can't actually rescue the governor right here, so we need to take the route back to the cannibals to create our secret LeChuck melting weapon and head back for a confrontation. I'd like to point out that at this point, the game does skip travel sequences thankfully. There's a lot of slow, slow moving in this game. Even when you're going fast, you're going pretty slowly. It can be a bit of a turn off for new players, especially those trying to figure things out. At least at this point, the game gives you a hand and says, yeah, okay, we know this bit takes a while, so we'll cut out the middleman. It's appreciated. When you get back to where the ghost ship was, all you find is LeChuck's unwilling ghost minion, Bob, who was left behind by mistake. He explains that LeChuck and Elaine are about to get married at the Melee Island Church, and we need to rush back there to stop the wedding. Herman then shows up to give us a hand as well. Wait, how did he get here without a navigator? Ah, never mind, not important. It turns out anyway that him and Bob are old friends. Bob! <laughs> what are you doing here? The trio then team up to rush all the way home. But wait, didn't we destroy our ship? How will we get back there? That seems like an oversight. Uh, you have a ship? <laughs> yep! If you have a ship, why are you waiting to be rescued? Why heck, if you're stranded, you've got to be rescued! Says so in the rules. Okay, I have a lot of questions about Herman. I think they're better off unanswered. Me too. <laughs> 
There are actually quite a few variables in this sequence. If you like, you can choose to kill Bob. I don't know why you would unless you're a heartless bastard, but wow. it's an option. Also, if you didn't sink your ship, your crew will turn up to help out instead of Herman. It's a neat little detail that keeps oh, the game fresh on replays. Anyway, time to head back to Melee. I'll lend you my ship if you promise to rescue me with it. Okay. Well, let's go! Well, that certainly was easier than the trip to Monkey Island. Much like part two, part four is also pretty short, and it's very much there to just kind of wrap the game up. On the way to the church in Melee Town, Guybrush gets accosted by a couple of ghosts, but we can deal with that. Guybrush reaches the ceremony just in time, infuriating LeChuck. I've come to stop you from marrying Governor Marley. How do you plan to do that? Governor! Governor! Governor? What's going on? Yeah, oh, what is going on here? Fool. Elaine turns up, proving that actually, she was able to take care of herself. And Guybrush's rescue plans serve very little purpose, other than... Uh, uh, rescuing Bob, maybe? And Herman? Hmm. Is that a net loss or a net gain? We did potentially kill three people in the process. Hey. If you're here, then who's that in the dress? What? It turns out that Elaine's plan was to trick LeChuck using two monkeys in a dress, holding her own batch of voodoo root beer to kill him with. I actually I really like this reveal. It plays well to Monkey Island's tendency to flout the usual video game tropes. Rather than the damsel in distress needing a dashing hero, it turns out that the damsel is the dashing hero. And you? Well, you're just the comedy sidekick. An inept doofus getting in the way. So yeah, Guybrush messes things up because of course he does. And Elaine goes after the escaping monkeys, leaving... Uh-oh. Say now, let's not be hasty. <laughs> this is it, the final confrontation. We have no root beer, no lane, and LeChuck is punching Guybrush across the whole island. Eventually, Guybrush lands in the grog machine at stands and... Good to see you, son. How's the ship? This isn't the time, Stan. Howdy, partner. You know, just by looking at you, I can tell you're a man of the world. A man with an eye for quality. A man who knows a good bargain when he... Oh! Oh, bye, Stan. I'll maybe miss you. LeChuck fishes Guybrush from the machine, winding up another punch to send you flying. But if you're quick, you might notice some root beer on the ground there. Well, it might not be the anti-root, but it's worth a shot, right? <laughs> Huh, how about that? So that's the game? Let's see how we did. Thus ends the secret of Monkey Island, with LeChuck shooting off into the sky and exploding, making some pretty and rather romantic fireworks. Which of course then means that Guy Virgin and Elaine find themselves together, staring off at the pretty lights. While I was in the machine over at Stan's... Oh gosh, I hope Stan's okay. Oh, he's fine. Uh, I wish my crew could have seen this. You know... I can't shake the feeling that Guybrush was somehow responsible for that big rock sinking the ship. Oh, look at that. My crew is okay. I'll just have to remove them from the kill count. Uh, one second. Alright then, so what's the main takeaway from this game then? Never pay more than 20 bucks for a computer game. A what? I don't know. I'm not sure why I said that. Luckily, this game is much cheaper than that now. Unless you're buying an original box copy with the code wheels and such. You'll need more than 20 bucks for those. God, what a game. There's a reason this is remembered as such a classic. It's the adventure game that shaped adventure games for years to come.
It very much set the standard for a comedy adventure game and made them less frustrating to deal with. The Secret of Monkey Island took point and click adventure games by the hand and led them down a new path. A nicer path. A path less characterised by unfair dead ends and ridiculous deaths. And I love the ridiculous deaths, but it's probably better this way. It's difficult to summarise its importance, but it's up there with Doom for how it shaped the way we thought of a particular genre of games. And that's not to say that other ways aren't valid. I'll always go on record as being a Sierra fan, but god, LucasArts are just something else. They had it down to a fine art very quickly. I'd say this game was responsible for popularising dialogue puzzles as a core mechanic, especially with the iconic insult sword fighting. Plus, the way that the inventory puzzles are woven into The Secret of Monkey Island is masterful. I don't think there are many that fall under the typical moon logic that the genre can very often be guilty of. Almost every puzzle is signposted in some way if you look hard enough. But then there's also the way this package is presented, the way the story is told. The snark, the fourth wall breaks, the gorgeous pixel art and music, it's enveloping and hilarious and cheeky. And for a comedic coming of age story for a doofy kid who wants to be a pirate, it's pretty endearing too. The comedy has bits for everyone, I think. That comes down to the fact that he had both Tim Schafer and David Grossman as writers. Where Schafer was better at the more in-your-face sillier elements, Grossman excelled at the deadpan snark. There's a good mixture of the two, and they really play to their strengths at appropriate times. Neither outstay their welcome. It's not a perfect game. It's still a game from 1990. Which means it's incredibly difficult in places, and there's a lot of slowly moving back and forth between different areas. Which can be a little time-consuming. I still hold it very, very dearly to my heart. Even for me, it ranks maybe second or third in the series overall, but it's still a masterpiece, even 30 years after the fact. Not many games can say that. Your mileage may vary depending on how you feel about the genre, but to me, this is a must play. So the question now is, where do you go from this game? So we've covered how adventure games have had shortcomings over the years, how Monkey Island picked up on those and tried to learn from those errors. How do you then perfect that formula? You'll find out in the next episode of my Monkey Island retrospective, where I delve into the sequel. Released one year later, titled Monkey Island 2, LeChuck's Revenge.